Okay, everyone, good evening, and nice to see you with us this evening. And we just pray God will bless us as we meet around his word, and um, as we listen to every point from the Barnabas Fund. Um, we're going to start our service tonight with the singing of number 418, When, a life, when Upon Life's Billows, You Are Tempest Tossed. And we'll stand to sing, please. Thank you. Just a, a few announcements then for the incoming week. I um, want to thank Neville McCormick uh, from Barnabas Fund for coming along tonight. Thank you for that, Neville, and just looking forward to your report. Um, then on Sunday uh, morning, um, our, jo- our friend um, John Weir is back again on Sunday morning for his third Sunday. And again, if you can, please make every effort to come out to support John. Also remember John's mission up in Lisbon Carl Mission Hall at Drummer Hall this week, continuing this week at 8 o'clock each evening, and lift that up before the Lord in prayer as well. And then um, Sunday evening, again, um, Sean Morrison will be coming along to sing and to testify, and then Brian, or Brother Brian Cruz, will be, be speaking on Sunday evening. There's an office prayers meeting on Monday evening at 7 p.m., a ladies' prayer time on Tuesday morning at half past 10. And then next Wednesday evening for our prayer and Bible study, our brother Sammy Cruz will be coming along to bring God's word and to speak on Wednesday evening. Um, those are all by way of announcements. We make them in the subject to the will of the Lord. Just um, Lawrence um, would like to pass on his, his thanks for your ongoing prayers and please do continue to remember Lawrence in your prayers at this time. 
And on behalf of the church, I'd like to pass on Christian sympathies to Hilla Henry on the death of her sister. Again, we pray that God would um, indeed bless her and meet her at the point of her need at this time. I'm going to take open in prayer, and then I'm going to hand the, the meeting over to Neville. Lord God, we just gather together tonight. We just thank you for the promise in your word that where two or three are gathered in your name, that you are in the midst. We just thank you that we are gathered together tonight in your presence, and we come before a living Savior who has risen and is um, seated at the right hand of God, interceding for each and every one of us. No matter what our problems in life, Lord, we know that um, you're, you know all about us. You know everything that is happening to us, and we just thank you for that. And we just pray, Lord, that those in our, our fellowship this evening who need a special touch from me, Lord, we just lift them up before you at this time. We think of Lawrence, we think of Russell, we think of John, we think especially of Heller and her family at this time. We just lift them up before you, and we just pray that you would indeed draw near to them, that they would know your, your nearness to them, your, and your hand upon them at this time, and that you would meet them at the point of their need. We just think of the service this evening. We thank you for Neville coming along from Barnabas Fun. We just pray you bless him as he would and they bring his report to us, that you would indeed speak to him and through him, and that you'd use him tonight, Lord, to, to speak to us and to challenge us about that work that they do. And we just pray for the work, that indeed, Lord, that you would help that work to grow and to flourish, and that as you would um, seek for the new workers, Lord, in this area, that you would indeed bless and use them and help them, Lord, to... Um, increase the work in this area. We just pray that you continue to bless each and every aspect of our fellowship. We think of the Sunday School, especially, Lord, at this time. We thank you for the new numbers that have joined over the last week. Um, we just pray you continue to increase the numbers, and we just pray that on Sunday, indeed, Lord, that um, there have been more new faces um, come out on Sunday afternoon. We pray for, especially for our young people, Lord. We just thank you for them. We pray for those who are still doing exams, Lord, those who are still studying, and those who are at, um, that you would indeed be with them, help them, Lord, as they do that, and that just they would set the exams so that you'd be with them and you would help them bring to their remembrance all that um, they have learned. And we just pray that you would bless them, and indeed, Lord, that they would get the results that they need to do the further education courses that they desire. Lord, we just pray that you would keep our young people, Lord, in, in good Christian company, that you would bless them, Lord, and you, you would uh, just help them to be strong, those who are your children, Lord, to take their stand for you and that they're not be distracted by the temptations of the evil one in these days, we pray. We would just pray for those in, um, in our fellowship, Lord, who aren't able to meet us with us tonight um, due to old age or infirmity or those who have to work. And um, we thank especially of Mildred this time, Lord, we just pray that you would bless her in the home and that you would be with her and undertake for her there at this time, we pray as well. Lord, we just think of their... Um, all the aspects of the fellowship then, we think of the Sunday service, and again, Lord, just lift up before we pray and continue to bless John as he comes on Sunday morning. Indeed, we'll bless him and use him. We, we just thank you for the souls that you have um, led to Christ at Liz McCarr thus far in the mission, and we just pray that you continue to have your spirit work and convict and save many more souls in this week, we pray. And we think of Brian and the, and the evening gospel service, that you indeed bless him and use him, Lord, as he would bring forth the simple message of the gospel. And as Sharon would sing and testify, and Lord, that you would use that even to speak to unsaved other in the building or those listening in online, and indeed that souls would be convicted and saved and won for you this week, we pray. We just thank you for the, the young girl, Lord, that came to know you um, during the coaching week. We just pray you continue to bless her as she attends Sunday school, Lord, and that you would help her to grow in her faith and in her knowledge of you, and that you, you would indeed use the Sunday school teachers and staff there, Lord, to help her to develop in her Christian life, we pray. We ask all these things in your name, Lord, and for your glory alone. Amen. Thank you. Now we'll, we'll get switched over to, hopefully, a presentation will come up on the screen. <coughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Harry. <coughs> Just set my timer here so I don't um, go over. I've been told how long I have. Right, so yes, I am Nev. Uh, I'm from East Belfast. Um, I'm a reader in the Church of Ireland. Please don't hold that against me. Um, I am a Christian. <laughs> um, I'm also a daddy as well. I've got a nine-year-old daughter. Um, and I'm actually quite new to Barnabas Fund, believe it or not. I have been volunteering for a few years, but only just over a month ago, um, I got the call and I was asked, would I please come on the staff? We want to... Uh, 
we want to do more work in Ireland. So here I am. And actually, I'll let you into another secret. Um, this is the first time they've let me loose without supervision of a, a senior. So you're kind of guinea pigs in a sense. But I know you'll send a good report back. <laughs> At least I hope you will. Anyway, uh, so yes, I'm here to talk about Barnabas Fund. And of course, uh, before I dive in, um, Let's start the night off in the best possible way by looking at the Bible, which is the reason why we're all here in the first place. So Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10 says this, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I mean, some of you are have been supporters of Barnabas Fund for some time, you'll know that that especially is the part that we focus on. We are especially concerned to help those of the household of faith. I don't need to tell you this because we all here know the importance of doing good to all. I don't need to, you don't need to be converted to that point of view, but it is good to hear it said out loud every now and again, just to remind us, remind ourselves why we do what we do. And why do we do it? Why do we help people? We help the suffering church because they are suffering and they are in need. Um, we are helping them. It's, it's part of our mission as we strengthen and empower those, as we give them practical support and spiritual support. It's a witness to the world that's still outside of Christ. They see us Obey in Jesus' commandment, love one another, and that strengthens the Christian message. In fact, it's been well said that if, in a, in a Hindu context, say, for example, or a Muslim <coughs> context, to, to feel to look after your own would be viewed as deeply shameful and it would discredit the Christian faith. So, but we mustn't grow weary. That's the other thing. We, you know, in, in these very days when everything is difficult, political, economic upheaval, um, war, famine, plague, everybody out there is running for cover. They're anxious. They're deeply anxious. And they're hiding away. They're shrinking back. But for us as Christians, our God is faithful. This is the time for us to be bold, not a time to shrink back and to not to be anxious, but to have faith and to continue to show that faith by doing what pleases God, which is to help those in greater need than ourselves. So how does Barnabas help? Uh, and I'm going to try to bring you some, hopefully some updates, something that we've been doing recently. Uh, there's the we are one family, Chris. I should have. One in ten Christians are, in fact, persecuted for following Jesus. Uh, when Patrick Sukdio started Barnabas Fund almost 30 years ago, he said, you know, the cases were few and far between. One here, one there. Now the need is becoming overwhelming. It's one in ten. This slide is old. It's maybe more like one in seven now. And Barnabas Fund, we share with them from Christians, from us, from the West, through Christians, to Christians, that's our ethos, from Christians, that's in the West, through Christians, the network that Patrick and Barnabas have been setting up for the last 30 years, which is very, very robust now, and then it goes out to those who, who desperately need it. From Christians, through Christians, to Christians. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, Whenever you donate to a project, to a specific project, 100% of that money uh, will go to that project. That's what Barnabas Fund will guarantee. And the general fund, which is for general maintenance, obviously, uh, only 12% of that will be used for overheads, and all of the rest goes to topping up projects. From the 1st of May 2020 to April 2021, we delivered at least 344 projects in around 57 countries. So what do we do? How do we help specifically? So I want to look at 
I'm going to, I'll bring you three different areas. These are the main areas, and as you can see, there's 12 of them. Obviously, we can't look at them all, um, but we'll pick three. So, first one is food. Food aid, very important, especially these days, with food insecurity becoming more and more acute. Um, and so, traditionally, uh, we would send money to a place, say India, for example, as here, and then local partners, churches, Christian organisations would use that money to buy the food and distribute it. So, during the coronavirus, this man here is a, is a Christian pastor. Uh, his whole community went into lockdown. Nobody was coming to his church. He himself couldn't work. What does he do? He has no food. He has no money. Uh, no income to feed his family. So Barnabas Fund is able to step in, send some money, and then, here we go, food is delivered to pastors in need. Now, there's a problem um, because... Uh, let me just skip past this one because I know time is short. Yes, so more than 780,000 Christians were fed in the year 2020 by Barnabas using such, pro such programs. And as I said, food scarcity is becoming more acute. Um, roughly 2.4 billion people are living in food insecurity. In the, and in the year 2021, 811 million did suffer from actual hunger and malnutrition. The World Food Programme only this weekend released a report saying that this cycle of food insecurity, which is intensifying, is, is the new normal. That was a quote from the report. So, there's a problem. Um, more and more, increasingly, it's becoming very difficult to send money to certain countries. So, send money to a country to buy food, to distribute. Can't be done. There's four reasons for that. Number one is corruption. Uh, for example, in Syria, shortly after IS um, displaced a lot of people, if you sent money into Syria and you tried to to move things around the country, you had to pay bribes, and Barnabas Fund don't want to do that. Other organisations did do it, because they think, well, you know, it's a desperate situation, we just have to do what we have to do. However, Barnabas Fund know that, you know, we're stewarding other people's money, you know, and that you give sacrificially, and you give faithfully, and you give generously. And we took the position uh, that we would not um, pay bribes, ever. And we wanted to be completely transparent. So we can't send money to certain places, Syria being one of them. Another reason is that um, some countries have Western sanctions imposed on them. So Western banks, our banks, won't allow us to send money to a country no matter what it's for. So we can't do that. Say, for example, North Korea is an example of that. Russia, obvious one. Still other countries, like many parts of India, you can no longer send money simply because they are enacting more and more harsh anti-conversion laws. They're shutting down Christian charities. They're actively seeking them out and shutting them down. So you can't send money to them any longer. Not only that, to send money to a Christian organization in certain parts of India would be seen as proselytization, and that would mean you're going to draw attention to them and they are going to land in big trouble. So we can't send money there either. And finally, uh, in areas where there is extreme famine, for example, Madagascar, I think it was last year, uh, where there was just complete and total uh, catastrophic failure of the crops. So outside of the city, Antananarivo, there was nothing. You can send all the money you want. There's nothing to buy. And what little there is in the city is subject to hyperinflation. It just doesn't make any sense. So, what do we do then? What do we do? How do we get around this? Because the Christians are still there. They are still in need. And obviously we want to help them. So we have come up with this project here. It's called Food.Gives. Some of you may have heard of it. Uh, it was in the most recent magazine. So instead of sending money, we send actual food. Actual food. And I've actually got... How does it work? Um, individuals get, or, or groups, 
get a box or boxes like this. This is the exact box. And we just ask people, we give them a list of, a very short list of five or six dry items, flour, rice, split peas, that kind of thing. And we just say, listen, whenever you're going shopping, you know, you're buying yourself a bag of rice, just buy one extra bag of rice, stick it in there. You're buying some salt, buy some more salt, stick it in. And then after a week, two weeks, a month, whatever, the box is full, you seal it up, we give you the stickers, and then you call us and we come and collect the boxes. And when we have enough boxes to fill a shipping container, we send it to wherever the need is greatest. And this is, this map's a few weeks old now, right? But this is, uh, this is where we have sent some of the boxes. So if you look at the pink ones, that shows you uh, where the delivery has been completed. So there's one up there, um, top right there, Pakistan. We sent a food container, um, several tons. And my colleague here, Kat, who I should have introduced at the start, uh, he, he's very good with figures. He remembers all the numbers. He can tell you the exact amount of tons that we've sent. So ask him afterwards if you're interested. The ones that are the blue dotted lines, those are ones, those are shipments that are actually in transit now. Now, some of them may have arrived because, as I said, this is a few weeks old. But what I love about this map is that some of those destinations have Christians in them right now, like, for example, Namibia down there, Southwest Africa. And there are communities there that are struggling right, right now, and they're praying out to God day and night, Lord, help us. And what they don't realize is that the help is actually on, on its way as we speak. It's there in a ship, and it'll arrive soon. Sorry. So, we ship actual food. Now, that might seem inefficient. And I, when I first heard of this idea, I thought, crazy. So you, you're telling me that you're going to grow some rice in Southeast Asia and it's going to take months and months being shipped around the world. It's going to land on a Tesco shelf and then I'm going to come along and buy it and ship it all the way back again. <laughs> you know, it's crazy in a way. And yet it's the only solution um, because really and truly, honestly, these people are isolated. They are neglected by their own governments if they're Christians or they are just remote and you cannot send the money any longer, so this is the only solution. Yes, it's inefficient. It's not an ideal world, but we can't just leave them. And so Barnabas Fund have undertaken this project, and it's growing fast. And because of food insecurity, which is likely to get worse and not better, I would say this project is here for at least the midterm, like at least the next five years, maybe 10 years. Um, this is how we're gonna have to do it. And so the good thing is, however, that it's so easy for supporters to get involved with. You literally just, you can go on the website, you put your name and address in, a few days later you'll get three boxes in the post, fill that packed, you just, or you can do it as a group, you can do it as a church. Um, we're even trying to get youth groups and schools to sign up too. But this really, really makes a difference. And here's one here. Here's a, here's a man in Odessa, Ukraine. So we sent a massive shipment to Ukraine. And here he is in his home. And you can see there from the surroundings that, you know, life is hard enough for him. That box will mean, mean a big difference to him. And we have many, many stories where um, people have received these life-saving shipments. In Madagascar, I mentioned it just a minute ago, um, the situation was so dire that, uh, and there was, there was literally nothing. So you'll see this woman here on the right, um, and she's sitting there with cacti. These cacti are poisonous. If eaten over a longer period of time, would be fatal. But because there was no food, literally nothing at all, they were actually reduced to harvesting and eating these cacti. So we sent a big shipment of what's called EPAP. It's a porridge, it's a maize porridge. It's fortified with vitamins and minerals and other nutrients. And a small sachet, about 25 grams, is enough uh, to give a child all the nutrition it needs per day. Costs about six pence. And a severely mal malnourished child um, 
having just that porridge, no nothing else, just the porridge, no fruit, no veg, within two months will be completely transformed. So we ship that. It's very, very cheap and easy to get hold of, and it's cheap to ship in bulk. So food dot gives, and we're really pushing this because this is making such a big difference to communities. So I'd love you to take one of the leaflets and have we think about it. Think about doing it as a church. Um, right, let's now look at one particular area where we work. Pakistan. Pakistan. Now this is one of my favourite projects. Um, in Pakistan, if you're a Christian, it's 99.5% Muslim in Pakistan. In Pakistan, if you're a Christian, your career options are severely limited. If you're a woman, you could get a job in a house as a maid. Um, for guys, you could work sweeping the streets or cleaning out the sewers. A very dangerous and dirty and very low paid job. Or you could make bricks. You could make bricks. And often this will be like the whole family will do this. Now on this side you've got the man. This is a husband and wife team here. He's bringing the mortar. And then he brings it to his wife here who puts it in the mould and turns out the bricks. They work all day long. They have to work until they meet a quota. If they fail to reach their quota for the day, their meagre wages will be deducted. Now that's probably, you're, that's probably reminding you of a certain biblical story. And you're not the only one who thinks that. Um, the, the pay is low. Um, the big, the big problem comes not with the low pay in itself, but what happens when somebody gets sick, either, either one of the adults or often their children, or if there's a funeral and they have to pay funeral costs, what happens? They don't have anything to fall back on. So they do the only thing, that, take the only option that's available to them, and that is to take a loan from their boss, the brick kiln owner. And then that attracts interest and they have to pay interest, which is deducted from their wages. And what happens is within a generation, they have this massive debt, which they can never hope to repay. And there are many, many families who are literally trapped in an endless cycle of debt. And there are children who have inherited their father's debt and even occasionally their grandfather's debt. And they are trapped, absolutely locked in. So Barnabas... Uh, have been doing what I think is a brilliant work and they have been releasing these people from their debts. So they will come along and they will say to the brick kiln owner, how much does this person owe? 200 quid. It's nothing to us. There you go, there's the 200 quid. That's it, they're free from debt. And there's this family. This family have been freed. Now that transforms their whole lives. Um, because... Now they're able to receive all of their wages and one family I heard of used the extra money to buy a door for their house. You know, something so simple. Of course they've nothing to steal, nobody's going to break into their house but it'll stop rats running in, you know. Um, it'll mean they'll be a little bit warmer in the winter. So to date, Barnabas Fund has freed from debt, 1,473 families. That's a very exact figure. I got that from my colleague who oversees the project. I was in his office a few weeks ago. And he has, on his computer he showed me, he has a picture like this of every single family that they've freed. And he may even know them all by name. He's very, very good at what he does. And he is very, very passionate about it. He's got a picture of everyone. And we've set free. 1,473 families. Now here's the best bit. I've kept the best bit to last. The best bit is, so you've paid your debt. Now what are you going to do? And some of them are tempted to leave brick making altogether. But our colleague says, listen, don't be leaving your job because you're just going to end up in the street and you're going to be begging and then you'll be back in debt in no time. What you do is important and skillful work. Do it and take your full wages and use that money to send your kids to school, for example, or to do the things that you can do together as a family. 
But Barnabas Fund go even further than that. What they do is they use some of the project money to actually open... Um, there's another family that's been freed. To open clinics near the brick kilns so that they don't get sick again or when they do get sick, they don't get into debt with medical bills. So it stops them falling back into debt. They also... Um, pay for school teachers or they set up schools for the children of the brick kiln neighbours. Again, that means a whole family is going to escape the cycle. Their children will, will have an education and they will then be able to think of a future that doesn't involve making bricks. So, that's one of my favourite projects. Um, Pakistan, brick kiln making. The last one I want to talk to you about is leadership training. In Barnabas Fund have been doing this for many, many years. They will train local pastors, uh, especially ones in like Eastern Asia and places where, you know, communist countries where the church is kind of underground. And a lot of these guys here from Kazakhstan, they would all have been very isolated. They would have been on their own. And Barnabas Fund is able to set up uh, one-off training events and bring them all together, not only giving them training in the Bible, but allowing them to benefit from fellowship with each other, to encourage each other, because their, their ministry contest is extremely difficult. There's another one there in Sri Lanka and another one in Bangladesh, and there's the students getting their certificates. However, this is the latest uh, project. It's called the Shepherds Academy. This came about because... Barnabas, through their research, realised that uh, in the global south, Africa, East Asia, um, the Stan countries, there's at least two million uh, pastors, ministers, with no training at all, nothing, no theological training of any kind, and some may even be illiterate, at least two million of them. They don't have access to education or to theological education. And they can't afford it in any case. So the Shepherds Academy has been set up to meet this need because untrained pastors can't minister effectively to those in their congregations, those in their care. And the idea is to, to build up the church so that it can support itself in, in, in the future. Again, this is a long-term project. It'll take five years, ten years, longer. And it's flexible. Uh, it doesn't require them to, you know, like we do in the West, to take two years out of your life to do just the college full time. They couldn't, have, they couldn't do that anyway. So it's a flexible, modular study which goes to where they're at. In short, intensive bursts, they'll do the content and then they'll go back and practice it in their home context. And here's a couple of testimonials from the programme so far. This programme is still in its infancy. This is a place in Kenya. And um, one tutor said this. Last week, as we looked at Islam, the religion, and Muslims, the people, there were lots of emotions in the room. This was informed by the recent year attacks of churches by al-Shabaab within Nairobi and the northern region of Kenya. There was a unanimous learning moment on the need to love the people and encounter Islam, the religion. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And of course, one of the things that makes a Christian faith distinctive is that we love our enemies. And these guys are obviously being struck by that thought in a very powerful way. Here's another one. This is in South Sudan. Um, this is a student. The course is very relevant in my life. I am experiencing a transformation within me. The course will go a long way, helping me in ministry to dispense the word accurately with correct spiritual meaning that will edify the body of Christ. And I think he's just spot on there, isn't he? Um, if you had a pastor who had no, who didn't, who'd never read the Bible, who couldn't read the Bible, who who didn't know anything about the Bible, would you like him to come out and give you counsel? Would you trust what he said? But for many, many in the global south, they have no choice. But Barnabas Fund is trying to change that. 
So again, these are the things that we're doing with your money, with your um, faithful support. And you're making a big, big difference. For those who really excel in study, uh, they can then dream about the possibility of coming over to Oxford under sponsorship and the Oxford Centre for Religion and Public Life, which Barnabas Fund set up through a subsidiary. And they can actually get PhDs and then they can go back to their countries, um, Africa, wherever, and then train up more people. And that is delivered through, it's accredited by um, recognised universities. So, I just want to say a little bit, just to finish, um, on exactly how your support really makes a difference on the ground to ordinary people. And this is a family in Pakistan. They'd run out of food. Uh, I think they'd suffered a locust plague. And um, they were praying. We were praying, God, send angels to help. It's interesting that the way they were praying, oh, send angels to help us. And God sent Barnabas to feed us. And so when prayers are answered and God is glorified, not only um, by the family and themselves, but by the neighbours, by those looking on from outside, they see, oh, it makes them stop and take notice. Here's another one. And I find that this kind of, um, this kind of story I find incredible. This is just a, an ordinary woman who works in the fields every day, uh, Burkina Faso, and she became a Christian uh, from a Muslim background. And her husband basically says, listen, either you reconvert or else just out, go. And very strangely, he actually let her take the children as well, but he, he, he kicked them all out. Muslim men are very fond of their children. They usually hold on to them. But there she was, destitute. What's she going to do now without the support of her community? Rejected. Uh, but she, you know, not being able to deny my faith, I decided to be faithful to my Lord. <laughs> That's incredible faith. And then here we go. Barnabas are able to bring her some food deliveries. And she is, of course, humbled and amazed. Um, and what a, what a testament. Uh, faithfulness, God, our shepherd, who's always able to provide for us, even in the darkest valley. Uh, here's another one. There are people who are far away from us and who heard the news of our plight. I send my thanks to Barnabas Fund, who hurried to our aid. Although they do not know us physically, they know us by the compassion of God. They sympathize with our pain in prayer and in financial support. The bags of corn and rice you see are a sign of this compassion. And that is why I think, you know, this isn't just aid. You know, this isn't just, oh, showing pity and giving aid. This is, this is mission in a sense too. It really does witness and testify to God's power, God's faithfulness, God's goodness. Um, another one, I better go on because I'm about to run out of time, but I'll just finish with this very last one. So, because this shows the effect on unbelievers. This help has had an impact not only on the believers who are strengthened in their following and trust in God, but also for their non-believing relatives and family members who saw that believers help each other. And isn't this what happened in the early church? You know, how, you know, they fed their own, and they also fed outsiders too, and the church grew dramatically as a result. So it works. This was the greatest testimony of God's care for his children through the help of Barnabas Fund. And really when we say Barnabas Fund, you know, it's you, because you're the ones who support it and keep it up. This was the second aid from the fund, and the package was not only food, but also added hygiene items. As a result of the help, the joy of the believers and the amazement of the unbelievers only increased. Many praised the Lord with tears in their eyes for the prayers answered. And so I think, you know, um, like out there, you know, in those places where it's hard to be a Christian, that is like, it's like, a battlefield, a spiritual battlefield, and whenever they receive help like that in such a visible way, and unbelievers see it, that is um, that's a major blow to the enemy because it breaks down barriers and it shows God's goodness, and it is a witness 
to unbelievers. And, you know, uh, the wind is rising. Persecution is increasing. Global insecurity in every front is going to get worse, not better, unless there's some kind of dramatic intervention, of course. So the need is greater than ever, and we mustn't back off. So what can you do? Obviously, you have been doing a lot already. Feel just solidarity. Open your heart. Show sympathy. Read the stories. Um, and pray. Pray for these believers. And as you pray, you will naturally be moved to compassion. You'll want to speak up for them. You'll want to spread the word. And of course, you, you already give generously. But now we're, we're saying, listen, we've always sent money. We've never sent people. We've never sent anything apart from money to support our, our trusted partners to deliver the care. But now we're saying, now we can share as well. Uh, in a very simple way and it, it, it's so flexible uh, you can do it as an ongoing thing or you can just do it like as a one off like say Christmas time for example or whatever and you can do it as a group and think of all the intangible benefits that come from that a project together sharing to help suffering Christians so uh, we're always looking for new volunteers and we have a monthly prayer meeting as well, uh, which is online at the minute. And we'd love to invite you to be a volunteer or to join us. I think it's the third Monday of each month uh, online. And if you are interested in that, please talk to myself or Kat afterwards. We'll take your email and we'll make sure that you get an invite to that when it happens. But finally, just want to say thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, for everything you've done, for supporting this. Suffering Christians, they deserve our support. Um, and it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship of God. But thank you also for coming out on a Wednesday night, you know, uh, on a rainy Wednesday night. So thank you so much for your gifts, for your concern, solidarity, your prayers, and your support. And we just pray that we can continue to be a blessing to the church, the suffering church, together. Amen.